At the foot of the first set of stairs, they spotted Mrs. Norris skulking near the top. Oh, let's kick her just this once, Ron whispered in Harry's ear, but Harry shook his head. As they climbed carefully around her, Mrs. Norris turned her lamp-like eyes on them, but didn't do anything. They didn't meet anyone else until they reached the staircase up to the third floor. Peeves was bobbing halfway up, loosening the carpet so that people would trip. Who's there? he said. Suddenly, as they climbed toward him, he narrowed his wicked black eyes. No, you're there, even if I can't see you. Are you a ghoulie or a ghostie or a wee student beastie? He rose up in the air and floated there, squinting at them. Should call Filch, I should, if something's a creeping around unseen. Harry had a sudden idea. Peeves, he said in a hoarse whisper, the bloody baron has his own reasons for being invisible. Peeves almost fell out of the air in shock. He caught himself in time and hovered about a foot off the stairs. So sorry, your bloodiness, Mr. Baron, sir, he said greasily. My mistake, my mistake. I didn't see you. Of course I didn't. You're invisible. Forgive old Peeves his little joke, sir. I have business here, Peeves, croaked Harry. Stay away from this place tonight. I will, sir. I most certainly will, said Peeves, rising up in the air again. Hope your business goes well, Baron. I'll not bother you. And he scooted off. Brilliant, Harry whispered Ron. A few seconds later, they were out there outside the third floor corridor, and the door was already ajar. Well, there you are, Harry said quietly. Snape's already got past Fluffy. Seeing the open door somehow seemed to impress upon all three of them what was facing them. Underneath the cloak, Harry turned to the other two. If you want to go back, I won't blame you, he said. You can take the cloak. I won't need it now. Don't be stupid, said Ron. We're coming, said Hermione. Harry pushed the door open and the door creaked low, lumber, rumbling growls met their ears. All three of the dog's noses sniffed madly in their direction, even though it couldn't see them. What's that at its feet, Hermione whispered. Looks like a harp, said Ron. Snape must have left it there. It must wake up the moment you, oh, it must wake up the moment you stop playing, said Harry. Well, here goes. He put Hagrid's flute to his lips and blew. It wasn't really a tune, but from the first note, the beast's eyes began to droop. Harry hardly drew breath. Slowly, the dog's growls ceased. It tottered on its paws and fell to its knees. Then it slumped to the ground, fast asleep. Keep playing, Ron warned Harry as they slipped out of the cloak and crept toward the trap door. They could feel the dog's hot, smelly breath as they approached the giant heads. I think we'll be able to pull the door open, said Ron, peering over the dog's back. Want to go first, Hermione? No, I don't. All right, Ron gritted his teeth and stepped carefully over the dog's legs. He bent and pulled the ring of the trap door, which swung open. What can you see, Hermione? said anxiously. Nothing, just black. There's no way of climbing down. We'll just have to drop. Harry, who was still playing the flute, waved at Ron to get his attention and pointed at himself. You want to go first? Are you sure, said Ron? I don't know how deep this thing goes. Give the flute to Hermione so she can keep him asleep. Harry handed the flute over. In a few seconds silence, the dog growled and twitched. But the moment Hermione began to play, it fell back into its deep sleep. Harry climbed over it and looked down through the trap door. There was no sign of the bottom. He lowered himself through the hole until he was hanging on by his fingertips. Then he looked up at Ron and said, If anything happens to me, don't follow. Go straight to the owlery and send Hedwig to Dumbledore, right? Right, said Ron. See you in a minute, I hope. And Harry let go. Cold, damp air rushed past him as he fell down, 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 and flump! With a funny, muffled sort of a thump, he landed on something soft. He sat up and felt around, his eyes not used to the gloom. It felt as though he was sitting on some sort of plant. It's okay, he called up to the light the size of a postage stamp, which was the open trap door. It's a soft landing. You can jump. Ron followed straight away. He landed sprawled next to Harry. What is this stuff? were his first words. Dunno, some sort of plant thing, I think. 
I suppose it's here to break the fall. Come on, Hermione. The distance music stopped. There was a loud bark from the dog, but Hermione had already jumped. She landed on Harry's other side. We must be miles under the school, she said. Luck luckily, this plant thing's here. Really? said Ron. Lucky, shrieked Hermione. Look at you both. She leapt up and struggled towards a damp wall. She had to struggle because the moment she'd landed, the plant had started to twist snake-like tendril tendrils around her ankles. As for Harry and Ron, their legs had already been bound tightly in long creepers, without them even noticing. Hermione had managed to free herself before the plant got a firm grip on her. Now she watched in horror as the two boys fought to pull the plant off them, but the more they strained against it, the tighter and faster the plant wound around them. Stop moving, Hermione ordered them. I know what this is. It's Devil's Snare. Oh, I'm so glad we know what it's called. That's a great help, snarled Ron, leaning back, trying to stop the plant curling around its neck. Shut up, I'm trying to remember how to kill it, said Hermione. Well, hurry up, I can't breathe, Harry gasped, wrestling with it as it curled around his chest. Devil's snare, devil's snare. What did Professor Sprout say? It likes the dark and the damp. So light a fire, Harry choked. Yes, of course, but there's no wood, Hermione cried, wringing her hands. Have you gone mad, Ron bellowed. Are you a witch or not? Oh, right, said Hermione, as she whipped out her wand, waved it, muttered something, and sent a jet of the same bluebell flame she had used on Snape at the plant. In a matter of seconds, the two boys felt it loosening its grip as it cringed away from the light and the warmth. Wriggling and flailing, it unraveled itself from their bodies, and they were able to pull free. Lucky you pay attention in Herbology, Hermione. Said, as, um, said Harry as he joined her by the wall, wiping sweat off his face. Yeah, said Ron, and lucky Harry doesn't lose his head in a crisis. There's no wood, honestly. This way, said Harry, pointing down a stone passageway, which was the only way on. All they could hear apart from their footsteps was the gentle dripping of water trickling down the walls. The passageway sloped downwards and Harry was reminded of Gringotts, with an unpleasant jolt of the heart, he remembered the dragon said to be guarding the vaults in the wizard bank. If they met a dragon, a full-grown dragon, Norbert had been bad enough. Can you hear something? Ron whispered. Harry listened. A soft rustling and clinking seemed to be coming from up ahead. Do you think it's a ghost? I don't know. Sounds like wings to me. There's a light ahead. I can see something moving. They reached the end of the passageway and saw before them a brilliantly lit chamber, its ceilings arching high above them. It was full of small, jewel-bright birds, fluttering and tum tumbling all around the room. On the opposite side of the chamber was a heavy wooden door. Do you think they'll attack us if we cross the room, said Ron? Probably, said Harry. They don't look very vicious, but I suppose if they all swoop down at once, well... There's nothing for it. I'll run. He took a deep breath, covered his face with his arms, and sprinted across the room. He expected to feel sharp beaks and, and claws tearing at him any second. But nothing happened. He reached the door untouched. He pulled the handle, but it was locked. The other two followed him. They tugged and heaved at the door, but it wouldn't budge. Not even when Hermione tried her Alohomora charm. Now what? said Ron. These birds, they can't be just here for decoration, said Hermione. They watched the birds soaring overhead, glittering, glittering. They're not birds, Harry said suddenly. They're keys, winged keys. Look carefully. So that must mean, he looked around the chamber, while the other two squinted up at the flock of keys. Yes, look, broomsticks. We've got to catch the key to the door. But there are hundreds of them. Ron examined the lock on the door. We're looking for a big, old-fashioned one, probably silver like the handle. They seized a broomstick each and kicked off into the air, soaring into the mist of clouds of keys. They grabbed and snatched, but the bewitched keys darted and dived so quickly it was almost impossible to catch one. <clears throat> 
Not for nothing, though, was Harry the youngest seeker in a century. He had a knack of spotting things other people didn't. After a minute's weaving about through the whirl of rainbow feathers, he noticed a large silver key that had a bent wing, as if it had already been caught and stuffed roughly into the keyhole. That one, he called to the others. That big one there. No, there, with its bright blue wings. The feathers are all crumpled on one side. Ron went speeding in the direction that Harry was pointing, crashed into the ceiling and nearly fell off his broom. We've got to close in on it, Harry called, not taking his eyes off the key with the damaged wing. Ron, you come at it from above. Hermione, stay below and stop it going down, and I'll try to catch it. Right. Now! Ron dived. Hermione rocketed upwards. The key dodged them both, and Harry streaked after it. It sped towards the wall. Harry leant forward with a nasty crunching noise, pinned it against the stone with one hand. Ron and Hermione's cheers echoed around the chamber. They landed quickly and Harry ran to the door, the key struggling in his hand. He rammed it into the lock and turned. It worked. The moment the lock had clicked open, the key took flight again, looking very battered now that it had been caught twice. Ready? Harry asked the other two, his hand on the door handle. They nodded. He pulled the door open. The next chamber was so dark they couldn't see anything at all, but they stepped into it. Light suddenly flooded the room to reveal an astonishing sight. They were standing on the edge of a huge chessboard behind the black chessmen, which were all taller than they were and carved from what looked like black stone. Facing them, way across the chamber, were the white pieces. Harry, Ron, and Hermione shivered slightly. The towering white chessmen had no faces. Now what do we do? Harry whispered. It's obvious, isn't it? said Ron. We've got to play our way across the room. Behind the white pieces they could see another door. How? said Hermione nervously. I think, said Ron, we're going to have to be chessmen. He walked up to a black knight and put his hand out to touch the knight's horse. At once the stone sprang to life. The horse pawed the ground and the knight turned his helmeted head to look down at Ron. Do we um, have to join you to get across? The black, light, black knight nodded. Ron turned to the other two. This wants thinking about, he said. I suppose we've got to take the place of three of the black pieces. Harry and Hermione stayed quiet, watching Ron think. Finally, he said, Now don't be offended or anything, but neither of you two are that good at chess. We're not offended, said Harry quickly. Just tell us what to do. Well, Harry, you take the place of that bishop, and Hermione, you go there instead of the castle. What about you? I'm going to be a knight, said Ron. The chessmen seemed to have been listening because at these words, a knight, a bishop, and a castle turned their backs on the white pieces and walked off the board, leaving three empty squares which Harry, Ron, and Hermione took. White always plays first in chess, said Ron, peering across the board. Yes, look. A white pawn had moved forward two squares. Ron started to direct the black pieces. They moved silently wherever he sent them. Harry's knees were trembling. What if they lost? Harry, move diagonally, four squares to the right. Their first real shock came when their other knight was taken. The white queen smashed him to the floor and dragged him off the board, where he lay still, face down. Had to let that happen, said Ron, looking shaken. Leaves you free to take that bishop. Hermione, go on. Every time one of their men was lost, the white pieces showed no mercy. Soon there was a huddle of limp black players slumped across the wall. Twice Ron only just noticed in time that Harry and Hermione were in danger. He himself darted around the board, taking almost as many white pieces as they had lost black ones. We're nearly there, he muttered suddenly. Let me think. Let me think. The white queen turned her blank face toward him. Yes, said Ron softly. It's the only way. I've got to be taken. No, Harry and Hermione shouted. That's chess, snapped Ron. You've got to make some sacrifices. I'll make my move and she'll take me. That leaves you free to checkmate the king, Harry. 
But do you want to stop Snape or not? Ron, look, if you don't hurry up, he'll already have the stone. There was nothing else for it. Ready? Ron called, his face pale but determined. Here I go. Now don't hang around once you've won. He stepped forward and the White Queen pounced. She struck Ron hard around the head with her stone arm and he crashed to the floor. Hermione screamed but stayed on her square. The White Queen dragged Ron to one side. He looked as though he'd been knocked out. Shaking, Harry moved three spaces to the left. The White King took off his crown and threw it at Harry's feet. They had won. The chessmen parted and bowed, leaving the door ahead clear. With one last desperate look back at Ron, Harry and Hermione charged through the door and up the next passageway. What if he's... He'll be all right, said Harry, trying to convince himself. What do you reckon's next? We've had sprouts. That was the devil's snare. Flitwick must have put charms on the keys. McGonagall transfigured the chessmen to make them alive. That leaves Quirrell's spell and Snape's. They had reached another door. All right, Harry whispered. Go on. Harry pushed it open. A disgusting smell filled their nostrils, making both of them pull their robes over their noses. Eyes watering, they saw flat on the floor in front of them a troll, even larger than the one they had tackled, out cold, with a bloody lump on its head. I'm glad we didn't have to fight that one, Harry whispered, as they stepped carefully over its massive legs. Come on, I can't breathe. He pulled open the next door, both of them hardly daring to look at what came next, but there was nothing very frightening in here, just a table with seven differently shaped bottles standing on it in a line. Snapes, said Harry, what do we have to do? They stepped over the threshold and immediately a fire sprang up behind them in the doorway. It wasn't an ordinary fire either. It was purple. At the same time, instant black flames shot up in the doorway ahead, leaning toward, leaning, leading onwards. They were trapped. Look, Hermione sized a, seized a piece of a roll of paper lying next to the bottles. Harry looked over her shoulder to read it. Danger lies before you while safety lies behind. Two of us will help you, whichever you would find. One among us, seven, will let you move ahead. Another will transport the drinker back instead. Two among our number hold only nephil wine. Three of us are killers, wafing hidden in line. Choose, unless you wish to stay here forevermore. To help you in your choice, we give you these clues. Four. First, however, slyly, the poison tries to hide. You will always find some on Nephil wine left side. Second, different are those who stand at either end. But if you would move on towards, neither is your friend. Third, as you see clearly, all are different sizes. Neither dwarf nor giant holds death in their insides. Fourth, the second left and the second on the right are twins once you taste them, though different at first sight. Hermione let out a great sigh, oh, and Harry, amazed, saw that she was smiling. The very last thing he felt like doing. Brilliant, said Hermione. This isn't magic, it's logic, a puzzle. A lot of the greatest wizards haven't got an ounce of logic, but they'd be stuck here forever. So will we, won't we? Of course not, said Hermione. Everything we need is here on this paper. Seven bottles. Three are poison, two are wine. One will get us safely through the black fire and one will get us back through the purple. But how do we know which to drink? Give me a minute. Hermione read the paper several times, and she walked up and down the line of bottles, muttering to herself and pointing at them. At last, she clapped her hands. Got it, she said. The smallest bottle will get us through the black fire toward the stone. Harry looked at the tiny bottle. There's only enough there for one of us, he said. That's hardly one to swallow. They looked at each other. Which one will get you back through the purple flames? Hermione pointed at a rounded bottle at the right end of the line. Hermione, uh, you drink that, said Harry. No, listen, get back 
and get Ron. Grab brooms from the flying key room and they'll get you out the trap door and pass Fluffy. Go straight to the Owlery and send Hedwig to Dumbledore. We need him. I might be able to hold Snape off for a while, but I'm no match for him, really. But Harry, what if you know who's with him? Well, I was lucky once, wasn't I? said Harry, pointing at his scar. I might get lucky again. Hermione's lips trembled, and she suddenly dashed at Harry and threw her arms around him. Hermione, Harry, you're a great wizard, you know. I'm not as good as you, said Harry, very embarrassed, and she let go of him. Me, said Hermione, books and cleverness. There's more important things, friendship and bravery. And, oh, Harry, please be careful. You drink first, said Harry. You are sure which is which, aren't you? Positive, said Hermione. She took a long drink from the round bottle at the end and shuddered. It's not poison, said Harry anxiously. No, but it's like ice. Quick, go before it wears off. Good luck. Take care. Go! Hermione turned and walked straight through the purple fire. Harry took a deep breath and picked up the smallest bottle. He turned to face the black flames. Here I come, he said, and he drained the little bottle in one gulp. It was indeed as though ice was flooding through his body. He put the bottle down and walked forward. He braced himself, saw the black flames licking his body, but couldn't feel them. For a moment, he could see nothing but dark fire. Then he was on the other side in the last chamber. There was already someone there, but it wasn't Snape. It wasn't even Voldemort. <laughs>